Hello and welcome back to English Today. This is DVD 10 and the second DVD of your lower intermediate level. And in this DVD, we'll begin with another three episodes of our story, That's Life, followed by our special TV programs where our travel expert will be looking at capsule hotels. And then in our cinema program, we'll be talking about Bollywood. Then in the grammar section, we will study more about the forms will and going to in the future and their uses. We'll also study the past continuous tense and the different uses of the word like. So, I hope you enjoy yourselves. Alice, what are you going to do today? I don't know. Why? Well, I'm going to do some shopping for this evening. Would you like to come along? Mm. I'd like to make dinner for Jack's aunt. I also want to invite um, Sharon and Peter. My lesson is at three. I don't know what time I'll finish. Well, don't worry. I I'm going to do some work before that. I don't think I'll finish before five. So, what do you say? Okay. But only if you loan me your red hat. Okay, I'll lend you the hat. But be careful. If you lose it, I'll get very angry. Good morning, everyone. Oh, good morning, good morning Mrs. Andreini. What are you talking about? We're deciding what we're going to do today. How are you going to spend your day? I think I'll go for a walk in the city centre. Maybe do a little shopping. Oh, I think it's going to rain. Just look at those clouds. Hi, guys. Hi, Auntie. Morning. I'm on my way out. Jack, aren't you going to have breakfast? Oh, I can't, Auntie. I'm meeting a Japanese client. If I get there late, my boss will have a fit. You can't go on an empty stomach. Oh, don't worry. I'll have something to eat at lunch. Oh, wait, Jack. I'll come with you. So, we'll see each other at five. Don't forget. <laughs> I'm worried about Jack. He's so thin. Maybe he isn't eating enough. Oh, he won't starve if he misses breakfast. He seems so run down and so distracted. He's always thinking about something else. Maybe he's in love. Excuse me a moment. I'll get that. Hello and welcome back for another English language lesson on your live program. I want to tell you something else about will. Remember that we learned will for snap decisions, like I'll buy it. Well, now I want to teach you another use of will which is very common for predictions. And I want you to watch this situation which is very typical of the use of will. Okay, great. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and here is the weather forecast for the bank holiday weekend. In North Scotland, it will be very cold with outbreaks of snow in the mountains. Temperatures will remain low as a cold front moves across the region. Now, in the north of England, it will be somewhat wet as rain will move across the region until late into the night. So if you're planning on going walking, 
take some waterproof clothes with you. In East Anglia, it will be dry, but generally dull and rather cloudy, unfortunately. However, in South England, it will be a bright, clear day with sunshine, a day for the beach. And in southeast England, in the morning it will be foggy, but then it will clear in the afternoon and there will be a wonderful warm wind. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is the forecast for your weekend, your holiday weekend, and I hope you enjoy yourselves. If I were you, I would go to south England where the sun is shining. Goodbye. Okay, now there... I was telling you the weather forecast and that is a typical example of when we use will. Let's look at the board. Now, will is easy really, it's just the pronunciation which is difficult. I said tomorrow it'll be cold. You notice how it will becomes it'll, it'll. Strange pronunciation, yeah? So tomorrow, it'll be cold, it'll be sunny, it'll be winter. It won't be sunny is the negative. Won't, remember the difference between will not, won't, and want, won't, want. So be careful with that pronunciation. So it'll be sunny and it won't be sunny you could say okay so that's another use of will for predictions so we have learned snap decisions I'll buy it and predictions tomorrow it'll rain so what do you think it will do tomorrow we'll find out won't we okay see you in the next lesson bye This is Jack's Aunt Carolina. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'm Sharon Evans. I live next door. Another woman. And very pretty, I might add. Let me guess, you're Jack's friend too? Who knows why my nephew prefers female friends? Excuse me, I have to go. Sharon, why don't you stay? We can get to know each other better. Sharon, I'm a little worried about Jack. He's so distracted these days. Maybe there's something you know I don't. Me? I don't know anything, really. It's strange. I know his work is going very well. Maybe... There's a woman in the picture. Listen, I'm very sorry. As I told you, I don't know anything about it. Now, I really must get going. Okay, okay. What's the matter, Sharon? You look a little upset. I'm fine. Just, just a little tired, that's all. Listen, Sharon. You seem like such a nice girl. May I ask you a favor? Certainly. Go right ahead. You know I'm going to leave in a few days. When I leave, will you take care of Jack? It would make me feel so much better. Oh, well, I don't know. I don't know if I can do that. And why not? I'm not really the right person. And I'm also engaged to Peter. We live together. Engaged. That's strange. Why do you say that? Because love is joyful, my girl. And you seem, well, you seem so unhappy.
Hello again and welcome back. Jack's aunt is like a walking x-ray, isn't she? Now I want to look at going to with you again. Remember in the last lesson, some lessons ago, we learned going to for a future intention. You know when I won to, it was 20,000 euro, I said, I'm going to have a good holiday. Well, I want to look at another use of going to now, which is for inevitable results. Let me give you an example. If I take this jug and this glass and I start pouring water like this into it, right to the... Oh, I say stop. It's going to overflow. You can see it happening and the result is inevitable. So this is another situation when we use going to. Let me give you some other examples. For example, let's think football. Yeah, you see the umpire, the referee, you see the referee, yeah? He does this, mm, red card. Inevitable, inevitable result is he's going to send off a player, red card. Look at this. <coughs> <clears throat> I'm going to make a speech. I'm clearing my throat. I'm preparing myself. The inevitable result is I'm going to make a speech. Okay, now this. <gasps> my God, it's four o'clock. Um, my train is at quarter past four and it takes me 20 minutes to get there by taxi. Oh no, inevitable result. I'm going to miss my train. All right. One more example. Watch me. I'm going to fall asleep. That's the inevitable reaction. Okay, so I want to look at those with you on the screen now. Let's have a look. So. Before we said that we use going to for future intentions, so let's remind ourselves of that. So, I'm going to learn Portuguese, for example, or he's going to make a speech. These are intentions, okay? Be careful, you're going to drop those plates. Okay, so, when it's an intention, you often think about the plan, you've planned it before. Remember that? I'm going to go on holiday, I'm going to buy some beautiful plates. It's all planned and programmed. But going to, in this situation I showed you, is for something you see is about to happen. So, I look at my clock. I'm going to miss my train. The referee's going to send him off the football pitch example be careful you're going to lose the match in the football situation for example okay so these are all things that are going to happen you see them and it's inevitable so you need to decide between the two situations all right whether it's an intention or whether it's a predictable uh, action or result now, an intention for you is you are going to be very good at English, okay? That's a future intention. Good. So that's going to, and I'll see you again in the next lesson. Bye. Hello, Anne. You're very beautiful this evening. Come on. Would you like a nice big kiss? <laughs> but, Peter, are you crazy? What's the special occasion? I'm so happy. I'm elated. But you're never like this. What's happened? Do you remember that famous director who was at my performance? What did he look like? You know, that tall, well-dressed man, about 50 years old. He looked like Clark Gable. Oh, yes. Now I remember. 
Well, he said he wanted to direct a musical in Japan. Yes. And? But so what? And he said he wanted me to do an audition. <laughs> yes. But I can't stand the suspense. What about him? Well, today I auditioned. And listen to this, Anne. He wants me to go with him to Japan. Oh, congratulations, Peter. That's fantastic. I'm, I'm so happy for you. Oh, now tell me everything. What was the audition like? I was very nervous. At first, he asked me to sing. And then he asked me to act like a snob. You know, they're putting on My Fair Lady. And they're looking for an actor to play the professor of pronunciation. Remember, this professor transforms a simple flower girl into a high society star. Oh, wow! A leading role! You are perfect for the part. But you like wearing fancy scarves. You enjoy using a superior tone of voice. And Are you going to move to Japan? Of course. I'm so excited about the idea of living there. I wonder what it will be like. What does Sharon think about all this? Well, she doesn't know yet. You know, she's so moody. Mm. I need to find the right words. Anyways, all I can think about now is celebrating. <laughs> Do you want to go dancing? But you hate dancing, Peter. I know. But I want to be crazy tonight. Put on your best dress. I want you to look like... Sophia Loren. Oh. <laughs> hey, what's happening here? You're kissing each other. Alice, now hold on. I'm leaving for Japan. For Japan? What are you going to do in Japan? I'm going to act in a great musical. My Fair Lady. That's amazing. And when are you going to leave? I don't really know yet. I think we're going to leave in two or three weeks, at the most. And what does Sharon think about this? Sharon? Sharon? All you want to know about is Sharon. I imagine she'll be very pleased to come with me. At any rate, it's time to party. <laughs> We're going dancing. Would you like to join us? Dancing? Why aren't you always like this? Going to Japan is making you much more fun. again and welcome back to English Today for some more English lessons. Japan. Now that's an interesting destination, isn't it? Have you ever been there? No, neither have I. I'd love to go. Now in this lesson I'd like to do some revision about the simple past irregular verbs and I want to do a type of quiz with you. It's very simple just to see if you can remember the irregular verbs, okay? I will say something, a phrase, in the positive form, in the past. Let me give you an example. I said that yesterday. Now, you have to find the infinitive of the past tense and formulate the question. So, I said that yesterday. What's the question? What... Remember, yeah, the auxiliary for the simple past is did. What did I... Now, said is the past tense of what? Say. Exactly. So, what did I say yesterday? All right, that's the quiz. I say the positive form, you make the question form. All right, let's start. Okay. I sold it yesterday. I sold it yesterday. When? Sold. When did I sell it? Okay, sell, sold. Next one. I met him on Monday. I met him on Monday. Met. So, when? Yeah, okay. When did I meet him? When did I meet him? 
Very good. Next one. I came by train. I came by train. How came? Did I come? All right. How did I come? Very good. Next one. I had a problem. I had a problem. Be careful. I had a problem. What problem did you have? Remember, have always takes the auxiliary in the past tense and in the present tense. So, what problem did you have? Great. Next one. I bought it in England. I bought it in England. Where did you buy? Very good. Where did you buy it? Great. Next one. I found it on the bus. I found it on the bus. Where did you find? Find, found. Where did you find it? Good. Next. I thought it was good. I thought it was good. What did you think about it? Think, thought. What did you think about it? Great. Next one. He was at home. He was at home. Where? Be careful. Was. The verb to be, remember? An exception. Where did he be? No, no, you can't use the auxiliary with the verb to be so. He was at home. Where was he? Okay, so don't forget that. The verb to be is an exception, doesn't use auxiliaries. Right, next one. I flew by British Airways. Mm. Flew. How? Did you fly? Okay. I saw the film yesterday. I saw, S-A-W, the film yesterday. When? Did you see the film? Okay, great. We're getting good. I drank some wine. I drank some wine. What did you drink? And the last one, I took an aspirin took T O O K. I took an aspirin. What did you take? Fabulous. Let's go and look at those on the board now quickly just to remind you also of the spelling. All right. So I said that yesterday. What did you say? Said infinitive say. I sold it yesterday. When did you sell it? I met him on Monday. When did you meet him? I came by train. How did you come? I had a problem. What problem did you have? I bought it in England. Where did you buy it? I found it on the bus. Where did you find it? I thought it was good. What did you think about it? He was at home. Where was he? No, no auxiliary. I flew by British Airways. How did you fly? I saw the film yesterday. What did you see? I drank some wine. What did you drink? And I took an aspirin. What did you take? Great. You see, it's really just a question of practice. With the irregular past tense verbs, it's a question of memory and familiarizing yourselves with them. It will come with practice. Okay, great. So, see you in the next lesson. Bye. Hi, everybody. Wow. I'm really pleased to see everyone dressing up like this for me. <laughs> ha ha. 
You'd like to be the center of attention, wouldn't you? Well, of course. And that color really suits you. And Alice, made up like that, you look much older. What's happening anyway? Why are you all so elegant? Did I forget something? No, Jack. We're going out to celebrate with Peter. He's going to play a role in a musical. And he's moving to Japan. To Japan? <laughs> what does Sharon think about all this? She doesn't know. Anyway, according to Peter, she'll be ecstatic about the idea of moving to Japan. Moving to Japan? <laughs> what does Sharon have to do with Peter's musical, anyway? Well, you know how it is, Jack. When two people are together, they make changes together. And anyway, why do you care if Peter and Sharon move to Japan? Oh, I don't care. But I really don't think that Sharon is going to be happy about moving to Japan. That's what you think. Well, of course, I could be wrong. In any case, it's useless to make guesses. Hey, Jack. Do you want to come with us? Not really. Oh, tell Peter I'm sorry, but I don't really feel like celebrating tonight. Well, you don't know what you're missing. Sayonara, Jack. <laughs> Sayonara. Do you know what that is in English? Well, it's hello, hi, howdy, how you doing, how's it going? Sayonara. In that episode, we heard three interesting uses of like. Now, Anne said, what did he look like? Peter said, I wonder what it'll be like. And Peter also said, would you like to go dancing? Interesting, hey? This word like in English is really very, very interesting because it has different uses and different meanings. And Mr. Monkey is going to help me explain them to you. Now, if I ask the question, what would he like to do? What would he like to do? Mr. Monkey, what would you like to do? Mr. Monkey, you know what he said? He said he would like to find a Mrs. Monkey. <laughs> well, that's natural. What does it express? What would he like to do, would like, expresses desires, wishes and wants. So that's one form. What would he like to do? What is his desire? Would like with the conditional form. That's one. Next one. If I ask what does he like in the present tense, what does he like? Well, I know, I know he likes jumping around trees and eating nuts. What do you like? That's a question about your general likes, the things that you like doing on a regular basis. For example, I like singing. He likes eating nuts. What do you like doing? Do you like going to the cinema, going to the theater? So those are general likes, all right, number two. Number three, I say, what does he look like? The answer to that question is, well, He's got blonde hair, he's got a squashy n nose, and he's got short legs. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Monkey. Now, what does he look like? We use, when we're talking about somebody's physical appearance, what does he look like? What does my boyfriend look like? Well, he's, well, he's not too tall, actually. He's good-looking, he's dark, 
He's handsome. All right, look like is therefore uh, physical appearance. And the last one is if I say, what is he like? The verb to be with like, what is he like? Well, the answer with Mr. Monkey is he's kind, he's loving, he's generous, he's just gorgeous. So what is he like is the general impression about something. So that's four different uses of like. Very, very interesting. Let's look at them together on the board to help you. So the first thing, the first thing we said was talking about a specific request about something you desire or something you want. Okay, so what would he like to do? So would like. The answer could be, in his case, he'd like to have a long holiday in the sun. Yeah, and wouldn't you? All right. The next question was, what does he like? And this is for general likes, hobbies, for example. And the answer could be, well, he likes going to the theater and the cinema. He likes playing with other female monkeys. Okay. So... Next question was, what does he look like? Now that's for physical appearance, remember? What does he look like? He's dark, he's handsome, that's my boyfriend. He's short and blonde, that's Mr. Monkey. And then the last one is, what is he like? The verb to be with like at the end for general personality and character. So what's he like? Well, he's easygoing, he's very generous, he's friendly, etc. I want to draw your attention to one more question in English, which is often confused by people who speak other languages. The question, how is he, means only one thing in English. How is he, like how are you, is asking about somebody's general state of health, about how they're feeling. So, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. How is he is not about his appearance or his character, but about how he feels. How is he? He's fine. Or, well, he's a bit tired. He's a bit stressed. Okay? So, very, very interesting word, that like. And listen out for it for the different uses, because you'll find it very useful. Won't they, Mr. Monkey? Yeah. See you soon. Bye. Yes, sure. Okay, four o'clock is fine. I'll see you later. Bye. Who are you speaking to, Sharon? To the museum I sent my CV to. I'm going to have an interview this afternoon. Oh, great. But I really don't understand why you're in such a rush to find a job. You know very well I don't enjoy being a tour guide. Now, let's get back to us. Where were you last night? You didn't get home until three in the morning. I was out with Anne and Alice. Listen, Sharon, I have to tell you something very important. What's the matter, Peter? Is something wrong? Well, not really wrong, but... Yesterday, remember when I was waiting for you outside the gym. You saw that director, didn't you? The one who wants to put on a musical in Japan? Yes, that's the one. Well, he asked me to audition. And? Well, we had a meeting, and the audition went very well. It's a shame you weren't there. I was fantastic. Let me tell you what happened. Firstly, when I arrived, they were rehearsing the first scene of My Fair Lady. A girl was selling flowers in the street, and people were passing by without noticing her. 
The two men were watching the scene, laughing all the while. But then I sat down because I didn't want to interrupt anything. After that, all of a sudden, the director noticed me. He called out to me and asked me to play one of the roles. And here comes the best part. Finally, while I was singing, he interrupted me and he shouted, Great, my boy! The part is yours! Can you believe it, Sharon? I got the leading part. I'm really happy for you, Peter. You should be happy for both of us. Why is that? Because we're going to leave for Japan in two or three weeks at the most. You'll come with me, won't you, Sharon? Japan? But... But how? Uh, this is such a surprise. I... I don't know, Peter. I certainly wasn't expecting this. What's the problem? A change will do us both good. What's keeping you here? You don't seem happy with your work. That's true. I wanted a change, but I certainly wasn't expecting this. This is so sudden. I'm completely confused. Hello again. Peter and Japan, or Jack and England? Sharon, the choice is yours. What would you choose? Now, there was something that Peter said in that episode which is interesting and that I'd like to teach you now. He said, while I was singing, he interrupted me and shouted, the part is yours. While I was singing, he interrupted me. Now, that is an example of the past continuous tense which is what I'd like to look at with you now. And I want to give you some examples of that if you listen. Using my friend, the alchemist. Now this is the alchemist. And he travels through many countries looking for magical potions to help people. And he was traveling in Tibet for many, many days and was extremely tired. So he decided to lie down and rest. So Mr. Alchemist rested in the mountains of Tibet. And while he was resting, a magical butterfly from Tibet rested near his head to protect him. And these butterflies in Tibet protect good people from the evil around. And there are evil things in the mountains of Tibet. So while he was resting and regaining his energy, suddenly a ferocious lion appeared and saw the alchemist and the butterfly resting and thought, ha ha, a great two course dinner, a starter and a main course. As he was preparing to attack, the butterfly saw him but didn't move. As the lion was getting closer, suddenly the butterfly turned and cast a spell on the lion and the lion bit off his tongue and died. That was the end of the lion. And the alchemist survived. <laughs> Let's look at the language that I use there, the past continuous. Now the past continuous, as I said before, is a tense that we use when an action is continuing and is sometimes interrupted by another action. Look at the example. 
He was sleeping when the lion attacked. She was working when it happened. Now you notice it's I was, you were, he, she, it was, we were, you were, they were. Plus the infinitive form and ing. So she was working when it happened. We were watching TV when he phoned. They were relaxing when the lights went off. Now, the negative form is easy because you put the auxiliary into the negative. It, I wasn't concentrating when I dropped it. You weren't listening when the teacher explained it. You weren't. Check the pronunciation there. It wasn't working when I switched it on. The question form, you take the auxiliary and the subject form. What were you doing when he phoned? What were you doing? Where were you going when the news arrived? And who were they talking to when I saw them? Who were they talking to when I saw them? All right, so past continuous tense in order to describe actions which are continuing and can sometimes be interrupted. Or, for example, as I was telling the story, you were listening to me and learning the past continuous. Okay? Great. So that's the past continuous. Come back to the next lesson for some more new language. Bye. Hi, Anne. Mmm. What's that smell? What are you cooking? I'm cooking roast beef. Wow. I'm starving. You know, my sweet Anne, I was thinking about you today. About how you take care of Alice and me. You were fantastic. It's something I've been wanting to tell you for a long time. Come on, Jack. Stop it. Stop making fun of me. Oh, but it's true, Anne. <sighs> What's the matter? Why are you so nervous today? I know everything, Jack. I know all about you and Sharon. And what is it exactly that you know? That you had a relationship many years ago and that maybe you are still in love with her. And how did you find this out? I was tidying up in the living room the night of Peter's performance uh, when I saw your jacket and I was taking it to your room when something fell out. It was a photo, a very meaningful photo. You were kissing her. So I spoke to Sharon. And what did she say? She told me everything. Tell me the truth, Jack. Are you still in love with her? <laughs> well... I have to admit that seeing her makes me feel... But... Well, what about me, Jack? I thought... Well, I thought there was something special between us. And there is, Anne. 
I care very much about you. But... 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 Well... I thought we were just friends. Oh. Okay, Jack. I understand now. Wait, Anne. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. But it doesn't matter, Jack. Just remember, Sharon is going to Japan. Hello again and welcome back for some more English. In that last episode, there were some interesting sentences. Jack said, why were you so nervous? Why were you so nervous? This word so plus an adjective. And Sharon said, this is such a surprise. Such. Those are the words I want to look at with you now. So and such. Now, I want to illustrate them by telling you something about a holiday that I went on. Listen to how I use them. Now, in front of me, I have some objects which I found when I went to Tibet. I had a fantastic holiday in Tibet. It was so interesting. And we visited the monasteries there, which was so huge and so beautiful. And inside the monasteries, we met some monks. Now, there aren't actually many monks left in the monasteries anymore, but they were very interesting um, and so special. And we saw this instrument. This here is an instrument. And look, if you, you can open it, it's so strange. Look at this. And it's so long. And it's actually so difficult to blow. I'll try. Listen. <laughs> well, when they played it in Tibet, it was much easier. <laughs> anyway, so interesting, this. So they have these instruments. And the monks wear these. These hats. Look. Look. Oh, so strange, hey? Look at them. Very strange. So, all oh, very interesting. And in Tibet, obviously, the temperatures are low, and the Tibetans have a special type of milk. And this is a container where they keep the milk, and the milk is yak milk. It comes from um, these unusual cows with long hair and um, horns that make this milk, yak milk, which is so unpleasant if you're not used to it. <laughs> but anyway, it was such an interesting trip that I really recommend you should go and visit Tibet. Now, as I was describing Tibet to you, I was using both so and such. Let me show you how that works. So is usually followed by an adjective. The example is, Tibet is so interesting. Interesting is an adjective. So interesting, and it gives the impression of being very, extremely interesting, okay? We were so impressed by Tibet. So plus adjective. These instruments are so difficult to play, okay? They're so difficult to play. The monasteries are so huge. And it was so cheap. In fact, the holiday was so cheap. All right, so, so followed by an adjective. Now, such. I said it was such an interesting trip. Now, look at that. It was such is then followed by the noun, 
And if you have an adjective describing a noun that goes before, so look, it was such an interesting trip. Okay, not easy. It was not a, a such interesting, but such an interesting trip. Another example, it was such a different experience. So such goes before the noun and its adjective. In the plural, look at what happens. They sang with such deep voices. Yeah, in fact, in Tibet, the monks, they sing in their boots. They sing, incredible sound. You notice in this example, we take out a or a or an, which is the um, indefinite article. And it becomes, they sang with such deep voices. They wore such strange hats. All right? So, so and such. So we use with adjectives, such we use with the noun and its adjective. All right? So Tibet is so interesting. I recommend you go there for a trip. Okay. Great. Well, I look forward to seeing you in the next lesson for more English. Take care and keep practicing. Bye. Good morning. Welcome to this week's edition of the Travel Programme and welcome to Christine O'Tang, our travel expert. Good morning, Lucy. Well, Christine, statistics from the International Tourist Office show that Japan is the in destination at the moment for holidays. That doesn't surprise me. Japan's a fascinating country. Yes, I'm sure it is. But tourists do worry about high prices in Japan. It's true. Japan can be expensive, but there are ways to save money. Visitors can save on accommodation, for example. What do you have in mind? Well, I'm thinking of capsule hotels. There are lots of them in Tokyo and in other Japanese cities. What on earth is a capsule hotel? It's a low-budget hotel. It doesn't have bedrooms. Instead, it has capsules. You sleep in a capsule. This is a plastic box, two meters long, one meter wide and one meter high. Incredible. It sounds like a coffin. Yes, but they're more comfortable than a coffin. There's everything you need. A bed, a control panel for the light and heating, or air conditioning, a small TV near your feet, a radio, and an alarm clock. Don't tell me there's a shower too. Yes, there is a shower, but not in the capsule though. You share showers and toilet facilities with other guests. And how much does it cost? About 25 euros a night. Capsule hotels are really for office workers who miss their trains home at night. But tourists can sleep there too. Amazing. And only 25 euros. Do you think that an idea like that could work in Europe? Absolutely. In fact, there's at least one capsule hotel already in London. Does it have capsules too? No, it doesn't. There are traditional rooms, but they're very small. They're about seven square meters. Many of them don't have a window, and there isn't a wardrobe. Just two coat hangers. You need to pay extra to watch TV and to have your room cleaned. But there is a double bed and an ensuite bathroom with a shower, toilet, and wash basin. And how much does it cost in London? A room costs about 40 euros a night. But if there's a lot of demand, the room can cost more. You see, the hotel uses the concept of low-cost flights. And the earlier you book, the cheaper it is. So, if you book at the last minute, you pay more. That's it. Well, there are some interesting travel ideas there. If you're looking for a cheap place to stay in central London, you could try a capsule hotel. But remember to book early. On the other hand, if you're visiting Tokyo, why not spend a night in one of those capsules? It'll certainly be an unusual experience and you'll save some money too. Thanks, Christine. It's a pleasure.
Goodbye. And goodbye to all our travellers. See you next week. Christine said Japan is the in destination at the moment. We say something is in when it's fashionable and popular. We can say green is in or green is the in colour. This means that it's a popular colour at the moment. And did you know what a capsule hotel is? I didn't. It's a low budget hotel with capsules instead of rooms. Low budget means it doesn't cost very much, so a low budget hotel is cheap accommodation. Remember, accommodation is the place where you sleep. How much does it cost? This is the question you ask when you want to know the price of something. It costs about 25 euros a night. Notice we say the price of a hotel room, about 40 euros a night. We use about before the price to indicate that it isn't exact. It could cost a little more or a little less. And we say 40 euros a night. This means for one night. In London, the earlier you book a room, the cheaper it is. To book means to reserve. So you should book early. This means you should reserve the room as soon as you can. Because if you book at the last minute, it's more expensive. At the last minute means very late, just before you leave. So, now, let's look at some hotel vocabulary. A double room is a room with a double bed. A bed for two people. A single room is a room with a single bed for one person. Usually in a hotel room, there's a wardrobe, the place where you put your clothes. An ensuite bathroom is a private bathroom for your use only. In low-budget hotels, you often have to share the showers and toilet with other guests. Guests are the people who stay in a hotel. To share means that it's not only for you. When it's cold, you use the heating to make a room warm. In summer, when it's hot, you use the air conditioning to make a room cool. That's all for this time. Take care and see you next week. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Talk Cinema. And welcome to Sanjeev Gupta, our cinema expert. Hi Lucy and hello everyone. Well, Sanjeev, what are we talking about today? Bollywood. I'm sure you're a real expert, Sanjeev, and a fan. Absolutely. I adore Bollywood films. You know my brother's a director in Mumbai. Interesting. First of all, let's explain to our viewers what Bollywood is. Of course. Bollywood's the name given to the Indian film industry. It comes from Bombay and Hollywood, Bollywood. Bombay's the center of the Indian film industry. Bombay's now called Mumbai, but the name Bollywood is still used. As you seem to be such an expert, I can ask you lots of questions. Fire away. How many films are made in Bollywood each year? About 800. The same as the number of films that are made in Hollywood. Wow! Filmmaking's a really big business in India. That's right. Did you know that 14 million people in India go to the cinema every day? 14 million every day? I don't believe it. That's a huge number of people. That's right. There are lots of people in India, remember. But even so, it's a large number of cinema goers. It certainly is. But tell us. Is it true that Bollywood's now becoming more known internationally? Yes, it is. Many people from India now live overseas, especially in the UK and the USA. Today, in the UK, Bollywood films are screened in normal cinemas and are also broadcast on TV. The films are becoming popular with new audiences. Also, you know, Hollywood's beginning to copy Bollywood. The film Moulin Rouge, for example, used lots of ideas that are common in Bollywood films. I see. But what's so special about Bollywood films? The films are full of colour, with beautiful traditional Indian costumes and lots of Indian music and dancing. But there's one thing I don't like. The storylines are nearly always the same. Love stories, I mean. <laughs> I see. What about the actors? 
Does Bollywood have its own film stars? It certainly does. They're very famous and very rich, just like Hollywood stars. Well, stars are the same everywhere. But tell us, Sanjeev, are there any problems facing Bollywood? Unfortunately, there are. Illegal copying is the biggest problem facing the Bollywood studios. They lose lots of money because of piracy. Another problem is that young audiences are becoming bored with the traditional love story formula. Today, the studios have to create new storylines. A typical new film is the one that is set in a call center in Mumbai and follows the lives of six young Indians working there. Did you know, Lucy, that many young Indian graduates now work in call centers? They answer calls in English from customers in the U.S. and the U.K. Yes, I have heard of the new call centers in India. So the film mirrors real life. It sounds fascinating. Well, Bollywood's booming and is becoming more known internationally. The stories are rather similar, love stories. But some new, interesting storylines are creeping in, right, Sanjeev? Right. Thanks, Sanjeev, and goodbye. Goodbye. See you again next week for another edition of Talk Cinema. So, Bollywood is booming. We say something is booming when it is growing quickly and becoming successful. Bollywood is the name of India's film industry. The film industry is everything connected with making films. The music industry is everything connected with making music. Sanjeev said that Indian films are screened in cinemas in the UK and broadcast on TV. We say that a film is screened in a cinema, which means it is shown there. And a film is broadcast on TV, means it is shown on TV. Well, I didn't know there were so many cinema goers in India. A cinema goer is a person who goes to the cinema to watch films. Are you a cinema goer? Do you like love stories? A love story is a story about love. Most Indian films are love stories. In fact, the storylines are nearly all the same. A storyline is how a story develops. So the storyline of a film is what happens in the film. The audience is all the people in the cinema watching a film. In a theatre, the audience is the people watching a play. Young audiences in India are bored with love stories. This is a problem Sanjeev mentioned. He also said illegal copying and piracy are problems. Illegal copying is when somebody copies a film without permission. It is illegal. And piracy is when people sell the illegal copies. Bollywood studios lose money because of illegal copying and piracy. It's a problem for film and music industries all over the world. Do you remember the expression Sanjeev used when I told him I had lots of questions for him? He said, fire away. This is an informal way of saying, ask me those questions. Bye for now. See you next week.